Welcome to Tea with Marie. And I'm Marie Yunkin Waldman, your host, and we're so glad you came and joined us today. I hope you're sitting down someplace, having a cup of tea and relaxing, and uh, we'll be our guest as well. Hmm. So today we are going to talk about something that I consider very important, and so do a lot of other people, and that is water. And I have as my guest uh, Eugenia Marks sitting right next to me. Are you Dr. Marks? Or? No, I'm oh, not. Okay, Thank that's you. Right. I didn't want to miss that. Who is an expert on the whole water situation in Rhode Island, and she's with the Rhode Island Audubon Society, which is not a part of the National Audubon Society. Um, and you've had quite an interesting background, Eugenia. You, you were with the Poetry Society of America in New York at some point? Yes, I think all women of a certain age had a, a <laughs> circuitous route to where they got to. Um, and mine included the Poetry Society and a stint with the Ford Foundation as a teacher in an inner city school. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't and realize that. We could have talked for half an hour uh, on that. I know that you had some background with young children as yeah, well. So yeah, yeah, teacher. Now, you were in, in New York with the inner city schools? Or? That was in Atlanta. And then I got to North Carolina, where I did some graduate work in product design and did community gardens. And then I moved to Rhode Island and uh, started doing volunteer work for the Audubon Society, designing brochures. I uh, found that as I progressed with the Audubon Society and was asked to be the newsletter editor that I needed more education, so I went to Brown and did a master's in environmental studies. And then I've worked for Audubon for 28 years here. You are a multi-talented well. renaissance <laughs> woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's generous, but I'm afraid its mother is uh, the nece necessity route. That okay, we need to get rid of the pin because we're in a different show right now. Thank you, Janie. Um, <clears throat> so, and you were uh, at NYU, is that what you said, in New York? Yes, I graduated from Washington Square with a degree in art history and psychology. Oh, which no, is oh, no. <laughs> this, is so, this is too much. You're such a Renaissance person, Eugenia. Well, but that's okay. circuitous, I think. But to go for all the, you sound like me, that's why I'm laughing, <laughs> to go to all these different things and, and to have a lifetime to do them all is so thrilling. Don't yes. you think? Aren't we grateful <laughs> for that? <laughs> we are indeed. But just curious about the poetry aspect. Did you write poetry about nature? Yes, I think most of my poetry is about nature. Um, I was not a poet when I worked for the Poetry Society of America, uh, but that gave me a start and an idea that perhaps I could write. I've written here with the only street group, and I have presented poetry orally on several occasions. Wonderful. And I try to send one around to my friends once a year. Oh, that's great. Um, great. Well, uh, today we're going to talk about water, uh, something that I've been very concerned about. And I think of my mother, who was, died back in 83, so she was very involved out in Long Island in the 70s and the 60s, and involved with the water table on North Haven because that was between Shelter Island and Sag Harbor, and it was a very important thing. And she could not understand why young people were not more uh, interested in this whole concept of limited water supply and that type of thing. So we're going to start with, you're going you're to show us a little bit about how, how we obtain water and, and what happens and how we accumulate it and so on. You have, you have brought a Yes, I do. And Long Island is Im an important part of this story because hard as it is to believe there was a continental sized glacier that worked its way down from the North Pole across the northern hemisphere and got as far as Long Island. Mm -hmm. So the o offshore islands are the result of that glacier melting yeah, back and leaving that, a yeah. ridge of sand. But what it did in Rhode Island, after it had scraped through the bedrock that's underneath Rhode Island, and when it melted back here, of course it left Block Island, but it also left sand in the valleys. And now when rain percolates down through the earth, when rain soaks into the earth, it, in these areas where there is the sand and gravel, it can travel easily 
through the sand and gravel. By easily, I mean about one foot per day is its general movement. And those are the storage areas of groundwater that are the richest ones where we can draw water for public supply. And, and how far down is that about? Well, would you under say? the Chapuxet River in South Kingstown, which is where the Kingston Water Authority, the Kingston Water District gets its water, it's about 200 feet to bedrock. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the deeper river valleys. Southern Rhode Island has the most abundant groundwater hmm. because of these deep valleys of the rivers like the Beaver River and the Wood And that's Wood where Pocketuck. the glaciers kind of stopped, right? And the movement well, of the... Yes, exactly. The glaciers mm -hmm. stopped along the south coast. Yeah, on my leaving... route one there in Charleston, right. right there's some... Uh... Yes, the hill there, the yeah, moraine. Yeah. <clears throat> and so it left plenty of time for the melting ice to melt off the water that was embedded with sand that it had picked up as it oozed across the former landscape. So if, you, if you've ever been camping and carried water, you know how heavy water is. When it snows, that water is also very heavy, even though snow seems very light. The glacier is snow that never melted back during the summer. And it was a mile thick in some places. Hmm. So you can imagine that tremendous weight. So now let me get you to think about ice skating. And when you skate on that little blade of ice, your weight creates, um, wa creates a stream of water under your blade. And that's what you're really traveling on, is a stream of water as you skate. So the weight of the glacier pressing down on the earth created the same thing, where it slid on this little uh, trickle of water underneath it. And as it moved along, it picked up whatever was in its path. And when it melted back, that rock and sand and gravel melted back. So then let me get you to switch. The rock and sand and gravel melted back? Yes, it melted out of the ice that was the glacier. Oh, OK, OK. And where the glacier stayed in one place for a long time, it built up sand and gravel. So that's where you get the offshore islands, like Long Island oh, right. and, yeah. rock, and Block Island, Nantucket. Island, and, okay. Exactly. <laughs> or you get the hill in Charlestown, the glacial mm -hmm. moraine. Right, I heard about that, and the um, the rock formations very unique in that in that particular area, isn't it? The bedrock is underneath the glacial moraine. The rock formation you may be thinking of is westerly granite, and we'll have to talk about bedrock another time. Oh, that's but another <laughs> show. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Um, so we're talking about the origin of water and... Uh... Right, and in Rhode Island we're very fortunate because we get 42 to 52 inches of water a year, depending upon what part of Rhode Island you're in. You're talking about rain? Rain. Okay. So the least years. rain occurs on Aquidneck Island, where Newport is. Oh. The greatest rain occurs up around Exeter, the greatest amount of rain. And that rain soaks into the earth. Now, on Aquidneck Island, there's not much soil for it to soak into before you hit bedrock. You see the rocky shore. You can understand that the mm. island is very rocky. So there are not great uh, groundwater resources in Aquidneck Island. Oh, I see. So they get their water from reservoirs, dammed up streams, both on the island and in Little Compton and Tiverton. Okay, now Rhode Island, for a small state, has an incredible variety of topography and so forth, I guess. Yes, so it does. So this comes into play when we're talking about the water and how it's, uh, re <coughs> how it's stored and so forth, I would imagine. Um, but in Exeter, is there a sort of a, a, a pathway of storms that go up kind of that way and up toward Massachusetts. I know my daughter seems to live in the thunderstorm belt. I guess it's called a belt. Is that where Exeter's in that? That's an excellent observation. 
what happens is when the warm, moist air comes off the ocean, it's right about at Exeter and that line that you're describing, where it hits the colder air from northern New England. And then... Yeah, she's in Norfolk, Massachusetts, and it seems whenever I look at the weather and they have something coming, it goes right up the thunderstorms in the summer and the snowstorms in the winter also. Exactly. Mm -mm. Well, now we know that. So, um, so you have the streams and the ponds are being filled up with the rain and so on. And um, you were talking earlier about uh, the different temperatures of the various water in terms of the wildlife that live there and can, can uh, survive in those particular environments. Right. So where water is coming up from the ground to replenish the streams, and it's coming up from between the tiny grains of sand that were deposited by the glacier. The groundwater is typically 52 to 55 degrees, and so those streams are quite, quite cold all year round. Of course, they're colder in the wintertime because the air temperature makes them even colder. Mm -hmm. But where you have a pond and the water is not moving very fast, the sun is able to heat up that water. And warm water does not hold as much oxygen as the colder water. Because the molecules aren't that close together or something? I'm uh, not, uh, oh, sorry. you know, <laughs> I think that. Um, the atoms, I'm sorry, not the molecules. Okay. Right. Okay, <laughs> that's too much for me too. I was a biology major a long time ago, <laughs> so <laughs> I think I was, I was thinking of something my husband said the other day, so that's why that came out. Anyway, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Eugenia. <laughs> well, the uh, turbulence of the water collects oxygen molecules within the H2O molecules, mm -hmm. and um, and then the warmer water. Uh, expands and just and it doesn't hold the oxygen and so yes you get a different like you get perch and bass in a pond where you get trout in a stream and there are different um, invertebrates the th things like crayfish and the damselflies and dragonflies that spend their larval life their immature life underwater different species like cold running water than species that like the warm pond water. So we can see that if something happens to change the water or the temperature of it, that a lot of various organisms are going to be affected. Yes, that's true. That's why we need to protect water from various sorts of pollution. And it's not only chemical pollution, which is the first thing that always comes to mind, but it's also pollution like sand, because the sand covers over the rocks that the damselfly and, and yes, yeah. uh, prefer for their larvae to grow in. It, I mean, that's where the algae grows and they eat that, whereas it doesn't grow on the sand. And so you have a, a different habitat, a different home. Mm. It would be like the difference between living in a, in a modern house and, and a colonial home, mm. for example. There are different features, and they both are pleasant, but different people like to live in different styles right. of home. Now, you were talking um, earlier about how in Rhode Island we want to have a more integrated system of communication among the different resources like the Department of Environmental Management and so on and the Water Resource Board and can we talk a little bit about that in terms of uh, how the water supply is coordinated and maintained? The Water Resources Board is the state agency that works with the suppliers like Kingston Water District or the Woonsocket water board and assures that their piping and their pumping is in good condition, 